Hello, everyone. This is Tommy at World at War Comics, and we have another fantastic show for you today. But before we get into that, please hit the subscribe button. Make sure you hit that ring bell. That way you're notified every time a new interview is being dropped. And you know that really helps the algorithm and helps us bring more amazing interviews to you. All right. Um, uh, this podcast is brought to you by CN Chili's, the best hot sauce you could buy. Please go to cnchilies.com, use comics at checkout, and you'll save 15%. C-I-E-N-C-H-I-L-E-S.com. And it is brought to you by Comic Crusaders. If you want to see the most amazing comic book reviews, movie reviews, and even music, go to comiccrusaders.com. It is all there. All right, without further ado, I'm super excited to share with you KJ Kaminsky. He is the writer and creator of the resistance. Um, this is a blast. I really love it. It is a mixture of a sci-fi and GI Joe put together. Um, you're going to love this comic book. The art is fantastic. The character development is just crazy good. Um, it is published by big blue comics and uh, you could go to BigBlueComics.com and check out all the different titles um, that are under big blue. Um, and it is a lot of these comics, the resistance, there's Kestrel, and there's all kinds of different arcs of the Resistance. So this one right here is the Broadcast Offensive. I saw and met KJ at the San Diego Comic-Con and picked up this entire arc, and I loved it. He's coming on, and he's going to share all the news of everything that's going on. All right, without further ado, KJ and I. Thank you, everyone. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to World at War Comics. Today, my special guest is Mr. KJ Kaminsky. KJ, how are you doing today, man? Thanks for joining us. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, see you again. I know we met briefly at San Diego Comic-Con, but when I saw the art on your comic books, I was like, holy crap, is that G.I. Joe? Is it back? And then uh, we started looking at it. And I remember talking to you and I can't remember how you, because it's a it's a sci-fi, um, but it certainly has um, kind of that G.I. Joe team feel that we were kind of talking about earlier. Um, but just the character development and the universe that you've created is absolutely awesome. That was, I was super excited because we talked about coming on the podcast and I was like, I got to get them on, man. I'm loving this, man. So I got to jump on because I know you have a lot of other series too that I got to get. Yeah, uh, the resistance, I like to call them an uncompromising strike force. And they're made up of uh, alien refugees, human outlaws and bounty hunters 100 years in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I talk about G.I. Joe, I guess somebody actually asked about this recently. Mm -hmm. I, if you compare them to, to a sliver of G.I. Joe history, it'd probably be more like Renegades. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with the animated series. Oh, yeah. um, that, you know, that group of heroes on the run uh, and uh, the powers that be after them and fighting corruption and manipulation wherever it is. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Well, before we get too much into the resistance, I would love to go back. Um, and kind of learn the history of you and comics. So when did that passion for comic books begin for you? Oh, pretty young, I guess, you know, elementary school. Um, I started reading comics um, and uh, G.I. Joe is really what got me into it. Yeah. Um, when the toy line launched in 82, that Christmas, I got the vamp. Um, but it, it was probably a year or two later, right before the the animated series hit. I, I remember getting G.I. Joe number seven. Oh, wow. That was my, my first comic that I'll always remember. I know I had some, you know, random comics before that, but that was a comic that I know that I loved and held on to until my grandma threw it away a couple of years later. But yeah, that, I think that happened to a lot of people around the U.S. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and G.I. Joe really just sparked sparked my imagination and uh, uh, got into comics. And, um, you know, from there started getting into Transformers and then starting to see the in-house uh, ads for all of the Marvel Universe stuff. Yeah. And so eventually graduated into uh, Spider-Man and X-Men yeah. and then uh, the big indie scene by probably, I don't know, 12, I think. I, I remember at 12 years old, I said, I know when I get older, I'm going to work in comics. Yeah. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but <laughs> I'm going to work in comics when I grow up. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, did that passion for writing start about the same time when you were young or did that come a little later? 
That actually, yeah, it came later. It was, it's kind of, I, I thought I, I was going to be an artist. Okay. Uh, I always drew and created my own characters and created things. Um, I was always in art class all through um, up until high school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually my co-creator on the resistance, he was an artist also, and we would get together and talk about making comics and his talent was so much above mine. Yeah. I always kind of felt like I was never going to catch up. Uh, okay. And I knew that I was creating. Mm -hmm. And um, my sophomore year of high school, I was actually taking summer school mm -hmm. and took creative writing class. And that's when I decided, OK, I guess I'm going to be a writer instead. <laughs> well, that's awesome, though. That's where the passion. Yeah, was. but, you know, or was it? Like, how did you get into it? Was it the teacher that you just really liked and like everything opened up for you um, up to that point? Um, no, not the teacher. I, I'm kind of weird. I, I've never really connected with teachers. Yeah. <laughs> like I've never had a favorite teacher. I was talking about that with my mom recently. Yeah. yeah. But it was, it was just the, um, I guess, just the presentation or it was the textbook or something. Yeah. And allowing me to it seemed like the first time that I tried to express myself without art. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. always drawing first and writing after. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was the first time where I had to stay hands off, I think with, with the art side. Yeah. Uh, and realized, and then shortly after that is when my co-creator and I decided, well, let's team up then and see what we can come up with. Yeah. And yeah. created the resistance in 91 i think really so in high school you created it yeah yeah That's cool man wow wow so what's the like is one of the characters that you created in the resistance now oh all of them oh all, okay so yeah i didn't know if you like pretty much them. yeah oh that's no awesome. it's just kind of funny uh yeah um and the three characters that you see on the front there um yeah, yeah. Fulcrum, uh, who's on the the tall one, uh, the all white alien. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I create created him. Um, I, I was I designed him around sophomore right. year. Yeah, and then um, I had him in this, and one of the other characters in the book called Grim. Yep, Grim. Uh, yeah, we took the, those two the characters, veteran, right? the veteran then, uh, military guy. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Jason Krause had a design for Interval, the main character. Yep, right here in the middle. And, yeah. And then we sat down and co-created Adam. Yeah. Um, who uh, The character who is now called Melee. Yeah. And a character, Jade, who kind of, we kind of swapped her out for Kestrel. Nice, yeah. <laughs> Not a character. But yeah, those. What's that? The character development is awesome. Well, I think, you know, so these characters, I'm 48 now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I'm 48, yeah. Okay, so 32 years ago is when these characters first, you know, were formed. So they lived in my head for just decades. Like, you know, you you yeah. constantly refine their their histories are so, um, in my head, so, uh, 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 like, set up and uh, uh, laid out that, you know, they're fully formed characters the minute I start writing them because I've had decades to work on them. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, I mean, they they gel so good together. And uh, yeah, you could Thank tell you. that uh, they weren't created by individuals and you're trying to put them all together, man. There, there's a nice, uh -huh. like you said, nice teamwork. And I, you feel like as a writer, um, it's really working very well with one another, which is really cool. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's it, it's so hard because uh, when it comes to the resistance, like I'm a super fan of my own property. For sure. Like, you know, I'm very biased and and it's also hard to get up and say, oh, I'm writing the greatest thing ever here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've been so fortunate to work with the artists and colorists that I've worked with so far. Uh, Jason Johnson, who's the main artist on the on uh, the resistance um he got a start with jim lee back in the day that's a pretty um, good artist to get your start with yeah right Cat? <laughs> uh, wild storm studios he started uh, as an intern uh cool. went on to work on uh wetworks and uh gen 13 um 
We went on to do some DC work with Impulse and Flash, a little Generation X, uh, left the comic industry. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I just lucked out. He was looking to do uh, comics again. And I was looking for a Wildstorm type artist. That's crazy, man. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, the art is just phenomenal. It's just crazy good. Yeah. The, the new series, the new stuff that he's been working on, it, it, I think it blows the first series away. That's um, it's really some amazing stuff. And I, I'm so bummed. I should have sent you the stuff ahead of time. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm a backer, so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna get it right. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> so I'll definitely get it. So I'm really excited about that. Well, but then, and, and you on your website, the... there's so many different story arcs that I haven't. There was hyper. What's it called? Hyper. Uh... Hyper action. Hyper action, and that's part of the same universe, right? Yeah, yeah. And I like to call it a world because sometimes I feel like the term universe can be overwhelming. Yeah, and for I. Sure. You know, I'm trying to to create something very connected and very um, everything is happening in uh, the Pacific Southwest. OK, uh, so what was the U.S.? But hyperaction deals uh, more with the bounty hunters, mercenaries and criminals hmm. and tells some individual stories of the resistance history. Like okay. um, one of one of the stories is uh, it tells the story of Interval, the leader of the resistance. Hmm. Um when she was a bounty hunter and oh, why she's no longer a bounty hunter that's and cool. left that to, to, to um, chase this cause that she's yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. And uh, it's a double feature flip book. So you get two stories in each issue Nice, and the artwork is just fantastic. Yeah. Um, we've had uh, Drew E. Johnson was the artist on the interval story. Mm -hmm. Uh he did a run on Wonder Woman with Greg Ruka. Um, his more recent stuff has been uh, the Kong Godzilla graphic novels from uh, Legendary. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you don't mess around when you get artists. Yeah. You know, it's uh, a lot of this, though, has been, you know, going to conventions, sure, uh, and meeting people and, and finding like minded people who want to just make cool comics. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, somebody like Drew, I was able to catch him at a time where he had some space in his his schedule and uh he was coming off working for dc and moving to legendary yeah and so i was able to get him to do this 11 page story that's awesome that, yeah it just it just beautiful stuff but yeah. um and then uh jason howard um who's worked with robert kirkman and warren ellis a lot at image comics on uh super dinosaur and trees mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got him to him to do us or he did a story actually back in the 90s. And it was sitting in a drawer. And so I had it colored and we had somebody rescript it and letter it and it held up and he did a new cover. And so we got a story out of that. That's awesome. Um, that uh, introduced uh, two of our coolest bounty hunters. Yeah, that's so awesome, man. Yeah. Incre incredible. So how many different arcs do you have? So with The Resistance, there's uh, the Broadcast Offensive, which yep. is the first four issue miniseries. So I have and, that. I started at the right ones then, right? Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and I've kind of approached this, though, as if what we did in the 90s, mm -hmm. actually, the stories continued. Because mm -hmm. if you notice from the story, the team's been together for about five years. Yeah, yeah. And so back in the 90s, my co-creator, Jason Krause, and I, we formed a small company called Blue. Mm. And we actually published a couple anthologies with stories of the resistance. Ah. And that was going to be the formation of the team back in, I think that was 95 and 96. Mm. That I think I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I... Uh, um, so I kind of took that idea that, okay, these stories that Jason and I were going to tell, they were told. Yeah. And now here we are five years later. And this is a very um, consequential moment in the team's life. Yeah. Uh, so we have the broadcast offensive with four issues. Um, we did the hyper action to kind of flesh out the characters a little more. We've done three issues of that. Okay. Uh, the Kestrel one shot, which you showed off, 
I got uh, that is kind of an origin story of the character. Uh, um, tells the story awesome. of how she met Interval. Yeah, she's amazing. Kind of and sad. Then, um, uh, the oh, I'm sorry. The it's kind of sad though. And I don't want to give it away, but I felt really bad for her toward the end in issue three. I'm like, oh man, and she has to be in that same environment. So, yeah. And and that's what we're dealing with in this next story arc. Got you. Okay. Um, the bounty hunter blitz that's on Kickstarter right now. Nice. Um, it's uh, it's a ton of fun. Uh, a ton of bounty hunters going after the resistance because of the bounties on their heads. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and hopefully a lot of uh, good character moments and uh, uh, showing a lot of character when it comes to Interval and Kestrel. Yeah. Um, Jason Johnson is working on issue three right now. He's halfway through. Wow. Um, and issue one's on Kickstarter. So um, we should be able to keep it going. Nice. And um, we got a great colorist, Emmanuel Ordez Torres. And mm -hmm. I probably butchered the pr pronunciation but uh he's just his colors are just just popping and everyone's really happy with what he's doing right now for sure i mean if it's anything like the because he didn't do it on these ones though right he wasn't the uh, no uh, our original colorist on there uh his name was uh ross a campbell um okay. he, they're great got, yeah yeah um Unfortunately, he's gone on to greener pastures. Um, he's done a lot of work for DC the last few years. Okay, yeah, and, uh, and yeah, and I'm so happy for his success. It's you know, it's so good. Like I've worked with a lot of uh, veterans, yeah, but it's nice to see somebody like surpass and graduate from the indie comic scene. <laughs> yeah, like as a as a comic book writer, it hurts so much to lose someone that you know is really really good but you're so happy for him at the same time. So it's a, it's a weird emotion that you go through. Right. Like, oh, but yes, I'm so happy for you, but no. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and then I, you know, I kind of hope like, Oh, well, hopefully our book is help them get that job. And yeah, for sure. Right thing, you know, I mean, no doubt if he's looking to try and work for the big two, I would be shopping around the colors that I did in your comic. Right. Yeah, right. right an example right. of my skill set, Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So awesome. yeah, so I I would think so. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. And yeah, and it, you know, it's like uh, uh, his success could always bleed too. You know, absolutely. If, uh, if people want to see more, they they know that we he worked with us. Uh, and then Ross also worked on our um, my third series, Sophia Saturn. Okay, uh, he did all the colors for that too. That I uh, that was a separate from the resistance and hyperaction. It's a teen space adventure that I did with uh, Ben Herrera. Okay. Yeah. Who also worked on hyperaction. Oh, okay. Very good. So that's has nothing to do with the world that you created here. Completely Not yet. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Well, there's this thing. It's, it's set 300 years then, in the fu then. future of the resistance. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's set on Saturn or and around Saturn. Nice. So it could tie in. Oh, there's yeah. no, prerequisite reading or anything like that but um there there could be a time where maybe you see maybe interval lives that long yeah exactly <laughs> that's awesome though now th those two um issues that you said you wrote in the 90s that were kind of a prequel to the resistance and showed how they came together uh -huh. are, have those been put into comics that you're selling now under this label or that was something you did a long time ago and they're floating around somewhere um, I still have copies. Okay. Um, I'd like to reprint them in a trade at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, most of us that worked on them at that time are not as proud as we were when we were 19. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you grow, right? So, I mean, you should, should have growth from that. But still, I mean, I wonder if you could go back and just touch it up to make it at the level that you're doing now. Because the story is still the story, right? You just probably need to add and take away a little bit so it aligns with what you're doing now. Right. Well, I, I've just considered it continuity. Yeah. I've just considered it a part of continuity the whole time. Uh, Jason Krause, my co-creator, kind of teases me about it a lot of times. He's <laughs> like, nobody cares. You can change it. I'm like, no, it sticks. It's a prequel of how they all came together in their individual story. I think that would be pretty cool. Now right. that you got me hooked on all these characters. <laughs> right. Now you just want to know more. But, 
Yeah, we actually have some unpublished pages, an unpublished story. Um, uh, I I love to, but a lot of it is uh, getting quality artwork that we that we could reproduce. Yeah, yeah. Outside of scanning from the actual comics, most people there's I've collected over the years. I've tried to hold on to anything I could get my hands on, but most of those pages are are lost in the wind. Oh, yeah. And if you did have them, it would be really cool for a Kickstarter. Like if you hit certain goals that, that you could get a page and over time with your Kickstarters, you could put like four or five pages together to tell the whole story. I think that would be really cool. Like an additional thing to go after on your Kickstarters to support it, you know? Well, I still have copies. So I we actually, I offer them in the bigger packages. Oh, okay. And part of, you know, we we were young and we weren't, necessarily at a professional level yet so one of the things that i've been hesitant at is putting that forward and somebody judging on us oh. on that instead of what what we're doing now a oh, very um, good so yeah. with the bigger packages like it's great to throw in because they've seen all the other quality that we've we've managed to do at this point a really good point um, certainly don't want to do that but they were um they were uh actually distributed through diamond oh wow um, yeah, yeah, you know, at that time it yeah. was uh, Diamond. Uh, the mid '90s. Yeah, Diamond's only criteria was there was just a quality level. Yeah, and if you hit that quality level, that's it. Okay, well, yeah, we'll put you in the catalog. That's awesome. Yeah, and we got. I want to say, I mean, it was horrible for the time, but I, I want to say we got like 800 orders for the first like black and white book and then like 1200 for the color so meaning like there's a bunch of copies actually out there at shops or or there were at somebody's shop yeah yeah <laughs> and every once in a while at a show somebody brings one up oh how cool <laughs> that's awesome man <laughs> that's gotta be a cool feeling though yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah but you know again it's it's yeah. not at the same level, and definitely the writing is is the <laughs> worst out of everything. <laughs> I, I think I didn't know what I was doing when I was just some punk 18, 19 year old kid, just loved the X Men and GI Joe, and said, "Okay, let's do high action science fiction." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's so cool, and I think we all like if you grew up on comic books and you were riding your bike when you're ten or eight years old to the comic book store to get your you know, two comics for what are they, 50 cents at that time, probably. So my mom would give me a buck or two and uh, I would go down there and grab two comics and come back. And then when you read it, automatically you're like, man, I want to create my own characters and my own. So then you're, you're like 18, 19 and you carry that out and then it gets picked up by a distributor. Like, I think that's really cool. No matter how bad the story is and the art, I just think that's so fun because that was a dream of all of ours at that time. Yeah. Um, And it's, it's this funny thing I've been saying to my girlfriend, uh -huh. like not having like this great success right now, you know, it's moderate, but you know, moderate success only takes you so far in the comic industry. Yeah. But um, uh, the idea that it's not as special to like put a comic together nowadays, like you could go to Google and figure out a step-by-step -step of how to put a together a comic and yeah. In, in the mid 90s, like when we were doing shows, just ha having a comic was a huge deal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, times change. <laughs> change, yeah. I, no, I, you're it's, right. It's, it has gotten, I don't want to say it's easy, but the availability to be able to produce your own comic is, it's so right there, right? I mean, any, like you said, right. anybody do it. I'm using Comic Wellspring to print my my comics great, I mean, great place, it's yeah. so simple right you send in your right. pdf and you get a comic back you're like wow this is incredible you know there is a lot of work to learn it though and i made the same mistake right. you probably made when you were 19 and so that's why you got to have a, a decent editor and all that good oh, stuff over back then things are really that's when uh things were starting to go towards computers like okay. early you know this was early image yeah. um and I know we had to get like professional color separations for some pages and, mm. you know, those acetate, uh, yeah. acetate, uh, uh, like four level things. And we had to send those to the printer. Uh, the first uh, book we actually 
cut out we would print the lettering and then cut it out and tape it on the boards yeah i think we actually sent the boards to the printer wow because i think at that point you know i don't believe it was digital files really yeah yeah probably wasn't right you had to send in the the physical but now i'm trying to think of the second book that we did we might have had to buy a disc like like a square, like a weird floppy, cartridge disc. Floppies. Not the floppy. What were they? I can't remember. I was computer illiterate back then, so I didn't deal with any of the production stuff. I, um, our uh, uh, my co-creator Jason Krause, he went to uh, a local um, uh, uh, art college, mm. and his girlfriend too, and she was she was the one Nicole Guffrey, uh, now Nicole Worth. Uh, she was the one who handled all of our production stuff. And if it wasn't for her, there's no way we would have been able to figure out how to do all that stuff, especially when it came to color yeah. at that time. Well, that's awesome. You had someone that you could go to. That's cool. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think uh, that's a lot in comics, though. You know, it's, awesome. you know, they, right? they always say it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. And uh, I guess it's what who you know what they know <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah really so really so i need more friends who do sales i guess <laughs> exactly <laughs> now as as you're writing what is your favorite part in the process of putting a comic book together and then i'm going to ask you the opposite what is the one thing that you least like about that process and and when you say putting a comic together, you mean I mean writing? the writing, the the back and forth, the with the artist to try and make sure that everything is taking place, the putting it all together for whoever you're sending it to to print, the like all these different things, right? The lettering, like who's doing the lettering? You're you're someone else on your team is, or you do it? No, I do I do all the lettering. So back in the '90s, I I depended upon a lot of people to do all the production for me. Uh, when I decided to come back and do this again, mm -hmm. it I I had a garage band back in the day, and I would have a three three member garage band. I would sing and play guitar, and as long as I had a drummer and a bass player, I could go play a show. Yeah. So I thought about that with comics, and I said if I could letter and put the books together, right? I just need to hire an artist and a colorist, and mm -hmm. I got a comic. Yeah. Um. So I do all the production work, which is uh, you know a little. Oh, sometimes a lot, but, um, but no, uh, I'm trying to think what I dislike. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's good. I mean, you don't have to dislike some, I mean, right. you know, anything you do, no matter how much you love it, there's always one thing that is the lowest on, you might like it, but it's the lowest of the, you know, of the likability in the process. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously I think for most writers, uh -huh. the, the, greatest thing about making comics is when you get those pages yeah yeah like when an artist like at, at times can just grab images from your head somehow and yeah. put them on the on the page and you know you're working and you're on the, you're on the same page i guess um but g just getting great artwork from artists is just oh just like an amazing feeling yeah. Um, and, and also that feeling that you had something to do with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's awesome. Like, I agree. It's, it's weird. Like I say this often, I'm so proud to be part of this project Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because my artists and my colorists are just amazing. Um, and it's like, thank you for letting me be part of my project. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. No, it's awesome that to see your idea come to life. In pictures is absolutely yeah. incredible. Um, Mind you have no, it, and I, when I just could do it. It's just amazing that from here to there it happened, right? And and like I said earlier, like I used to want to be an artist, so I when I write, I picture pages, and oh. I joke that I'm a writer because I just can't draw the things that are in my head, yeah. and I got to convince somebody else to do it for me. <laughs> but uh uh so yeah that that idea like i've already seen these pages in my head and then to actually see them and be so close or better yeah like you know exceed expectations um 
but yeah, I, I just enjoy the whole process when it, my favorite part about this whole thing is the making comics Yeah, is, you know, and, and I don't use a writing program. I just use text edit. Okay. I just get a lot of satisfaction of writing page one panel one. Yeah. Yeah. That whole process of just from outline to finished script and just like, almost like a sculpture, you know, having it form. Yeah. Uh, and then the art from the thumbnails to when the, the pages come in and the coloring and, you know, trying to do my best on the lettering to, you know, uh, meet everybody else's standards that they've put forth. But um, yeah, that, that whole process and even getting to the final file to send to the, the printer and I'm a perfectionist and I go over and over and over, but yeah, that, is so joyful yeah Um, everything else is (laughs) selling comics not so much yeah we'll see there's that there's one aspect that's not your favorite right (laughs) yeah and it's a grind right grind yeah it's it's a grind and you know i'm you know i think a lot of us we're creative people because we don't really want to be in that business setting yeah. And I think nowadays it's it's just so different that um, to succeed, you have to be able to sell yourself and you are your own product. Mm-hmm. And if you can't sell yourself in this day and age, it's going to be really hard to succeed. Um, I I don't know that people really succeed on talent alone nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's hard. It's very crowded, especially when most of what you're selling has to take place through social media. Yes. Uh, social media is very busy. There's a lot of traffic and to to make noise, to understand the algorithms, to, to try and yeah. somehow cheat the algorithms. So you could, I mean, I'll send a post and 80% of the people who follow me don't get my post on right. Instagram. It goes to the 20% and then it goes to all these other random people that probably hate comics. I don't know. You right. know what I mean? So it's just, it's such a weird, like, process and to learn all of this is just it's draining to be honest right because you got your day job right you're doing this as a hobby because you love comics and you're trying to sell enough to where at least you break even that way you can make another issue because i love to do it um and then all of a sudden you're fighting some algorithm and i gotta take some like master's course to figure out how to reach people right. like comic books is crazy yeah um and you know i've spent a lot of time like kind of rejecting it yeah. And like thinking like, OK, in the future, I'll find somebody who knows how to do this and I'll pay them to do that. Yep. But then I realized like, well, I don't know that that's really sound business. Mm-hmm. Like when, when I, I had my own comic shop for a number of years and I would always talk with other friends who had businesses and there were certain things they wouldn't do in their business. And I would always say if if I expect my employees to clean the bathroom i should be willing to clean the bathroom too like yeah Yeah. that's the worst thing you can possibly do at you know at a comic shop (laughs) (laughs) but um so i'm trying to embrace it a little more and trying the idea of hiring somebody to do it Mm -hmm. but not knowing if they're doing their job right or wrong yeah kind of not the way to go you know like um I, I have an art background. So, you know, if an artist turns in something where anatomy is messed up or perspective or, you know, even simplistic um, uh, storytelling fundamentals, you know, I know to look for those things. But when it comes to social media, yeah, I've, I've kind of kept my head in the sand and said, oh, well, <laughs> let somebody else do it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, here we are. <laughs> here we are. Yeah, I mean, I I think, uh, you know, I work in the retail spot in the grocery industry. And, uh, you know, I've worked for like Nabisco and those type of companies and all their marketing is done through third parties. So there there is a place for it, for sure. The problem is it's not cheap. Right. Um, So as a comic book creator, to be able to afford someone who's going to do a decent job, you end up being a Fiverr, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, trying to hire someone to do some social media 
and they live in another country. The communication is really hard. And sometimes the execution of what you were thinking doesn't take place because of that barrier, right? I'm sure they're really good people and they do a really good job, right. their own language in their own country. And they're trying to do it here. And it's just very difficult, but that's what's affordable, right? And so it's just, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough trying to find, it's like an artist. Once you find an artist, I'm just like, oh my gosh, if you could just stay, I'll, I'll, I will love you forever, Right. But again, if they have an opportunity, you got to take your hands off and you got to be happy for them. But man, it's really hard to find an Excellent. artist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I, I've been very fortunate and uh, with finding the artists that I find. But again, I, I think we talked oh. about budgets earlier. When if, if you have a decent budget and you can be competitive. Sure. Um, but then if you spend all of your budget on your art, you don't have that budget to hire somebody else um, mm -hmm. to do social media or even spend it on advertising. Yeah. So how, <laughs> I'm going to ask you the question. So you, you uh, the uh, podcast has gotten uh, pretty good traction. Like yeah. how, how has that differed from uh, trying to market the comic? Well, I mean, the difference is I have talented people coming on the show that other okay. people hear from. Right. And so you get clicks by that. Right. And so I purposely try to mix in people that are at my stage in comics, which is very uh -huh. good. Right. Because I want to create a platform for indie comics, for people who are getting into it, because other people that want to get into it could listen and learn from that. Right. And then I try to mix in like a Jeremy Adams who is writing Green Lantern. Right. Every once in a while, you know, hopefully one of those folks reach back out to me and say, yeah, I'd love to be on your podcast. And then that's what attracts viewers. Um, and then so it's, it's got to be a good blend of both. Um, that way you get traction. Because if you're just doing people like me, right, they're like, eh, I never heard of that. And I don't know who this person right. is. And then your, your platform's not going to go very far. So, yeah, it definitely has to be a good blend. But I, I really love it. I'll be honest. I've learned so much just for talking to people like you that have done it and are successful. Um, and so there's a selfish success why yeah. I do it too, right? So. On the one side, I love comics. I want to meet people in the industry. I want to build a network of great people that love comics too. But on the selfish side, every time I do a podcast and I interview, I'm learning how to be better at the craft. And that's what yeah. I love about the podcast too. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's a little dual purpose, right? There's yeah, you want to do right for the indie scene. I try to support as many Kickstarters as possible that I could afford. Then on the same side, right, I also want to get something back out of that. And that's just knowledge so that I can yeah. be better and better at my craft. Right. And so uh, I'm I've been saying this to, or I've, I've been noticing a lot coming back in mm -hmm. the way that a lot of podcasts are networking together and stuff. Yeah. And but it also seems like, you know, it's very focused on promotions, just promoting. Creators. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, um, yeah. Do you think um, when you get more into content or uh, craft, do you think that that's that gives you a better reach? Do you think people get more interested in it? I think so, um, because it's very practical advice if you take it right. And so usually within the podcast, I just want to get to know the creator, the writer or the artist. So we usually start at the very beginning. So that way we understand how they got into it. I've had some unique conversations where maybe a grandparent got them into writing. Um, and, uh, or there was one teacher, they failed at everything, but there was one teacher that they made a connection with and it was an art teacher and they fell in love with that art teacher and that art teacher fell in love with that person and, and invested in that person. And all of a sudden they, they have this passion and now they're an amazing artist for the comic book industry. So you hear all these things and it's just amazing. Everyone's background and how different it is. And I, I love it. I just interviewed, um, a, a young woman. She goes by, uh, moon the storyteller and okay. she writes a comment called Luna. Um, and it is absolutely fabulous. It's for okay. concrete comics. Um, okay. and you can go back and check it out. She's a nurse. Um, she's a little, my age, if not a little bit older and she loves comics and she just wrote her first comic. And, uh, you listen to her story. She did not grow up reading comics. She didn't read comics until much later in life. Um, but she's amazing at what she does. She's a great storyteller. Um, and she, because she's a nurse, she has this, this like passion for people 
that a lot of us don't have unless you're in a profession where it has to draw it out of you. And so when yeah. you read her comic book, you could see there's a lot of care for each character and the reader. And it's hard to explain, but it's just awesome. And I would never know that unless I interviewed her. And she's amazing. I follow her and her content's great. She's just like, I don't know how to explain her, but she just, she's warm. I'm talking uh-huh. to her, felt like you walked away and got a hug. I mean, she's just pleasant, the most pleasant person, right? So yeah, it just it's awesome to, to be able to meet so many people. And then you, like I said, I, I grew up a G.I. Joe fan. Um, watched the cartoon um, for many, many years. In fact, if you go to YouTube and you look up Hasbro, oh, look at that. Yep, I saw that on your website. I got to get me one of those. It's uh, available as an add-on on the Kickstarter. Yeah. Oh, it is. I have to yeah. go back and add it. I didn't remember if I saw it or not, but I saw it on your I website. Just, I just put a couple copies. I mean, we're almost yeah. out, but. Yeah, that's uh, so awesome. But I mean, it's incredible, right? The, you grow up with all these things and you get older and then you meet someone like you that probably grew up very similar loving that too, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So there is a little bit of similarities, but it is and, a completely different story. And I was going to say, like, you know, our generation, um, I just recently uh, joined a, uh, a a kind of a club up here, the North County Cartoonist Club. Oh, cool. Um, and, and it's, uh, everyone's older than, than us. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm hearing different stories and stuff. But just how our generation, you know, yeah, we grew up with G.I. Joe and Transformers and probably got into the Marvel Universe. I'm sure you remember when Turtles got big and the yeah. black and white funny. funny and was huge, too. He yeah. Man. <laughs> um, and then uh, 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 Image Comics. Yeah. And then when Image Comics hit the scene, I yeah. think you know, most people of our generation saw that. And to me, I, I was, I, I was in the punk scene. Yeah. So it was this total DIY yeah. and like, Oh yeah, well, of course, look at what these guys are doing. We can do it ourselves. You no, know, not as punk as you could get in comics, what they all did when they created, right. right? <laughs> but, but keep in mind and uh, you know, I, I guess I'll quote uh, Mark Silvestri once said in an interview, Mm. he said, you know, it really wasn't that big of a risk what we were doing because we sold enough books that if it failed, they would have brought us back. Oh, they had to. Yeah. At that time, right. That there was this transition in comic books where the story became less important and the art took over. Right. Right. See Todd McFarlane's run. A lot of people argue it's not the best written run, but the art just right. changed everything, right? right? And so you have all these artists that had that kind of impact on anything they touched for Marvel. So you're right. They left. And if it failed, they would have to bring them back because they were scrambling for a few years trying to get that mojo back that they had right. when all those folks were with them, right? So yeah. I agree with you. I mean, that's such a good point. And Mark Silvestri is probably, I mean, Todd McFarlane's my guy, but Mark Silvestri is probably my favorite out of that group. Just oh, because okay. his art is just so detailed and I don't know how to explain it, but it's incredible. And his run right now, the Batman and Joker, uh, the Deadly Duo, yeah incredible it's probably one of the best dc comics right now too really i just love it yeah it's incredible but the art is I just picked up the first issue but i the... unfortunately i have not read a lot of comics nowadays yeah yeah i mean someone i i don't know i'm back that's why i love indie comics right i uh-huh. i can you you know what you're gonna get when you get an indie comic um because uh once you get to know the writer you get to know the story it's just much it's harder with dc because these people aren't as close to you as the the indie people are, right? It's very easy for me to go on Instagram and meet someone that I really enjoy and they'll come yeah. on the podcast or we could have a conversation. Uh, it's very unlikely. I mean, it happens. I do get people to respond and we get them on the show, but the ma- vast majority, they're not going to respond to anybody on Instagram. So it, you don't have that closeness to get to know them. So you don't really know their style until you pick up the book. And I've already paid $4 an hour, $5. And I don't like the book. And I'm like, ah, you know what I mean? So that's why I love indie. I'm 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 buying what I like and I know these people for the most part. Yeah. Um, I you know, it's obviously you know the indie scene is tough though. I mean, you know, the resistance for me, if I could, I would do at least a hundred issues. Yeah. And I have an outline for a hundred issues. Mm-hmm. And I, I I constantly think of things like the elementals 
uh, uh, gold, uh, gold digger, uh, and now the savage, uh, savage dragon with Eric Larson. Yeah. Um, these long form series, indie series done by the one of the main creators. Sure. And you get just such a different, um, you get a consistent voice, but you also, you, you get something unhampered by the corporate uh hands that be <laughs> yeah I mean, um, so that, that's what's awesome about it right but but it's you know the idea of being able to do that in today's market is very difficult i mean you know you asked what kind of story arcs we have and i would have loved to do this this new series at issue four and yeah. not do it new issue number one yeah but yeah. it just wouldn't make sense like you know it's not going to do as well yeah. if you brand it with a new issue one and um the idea of getting to you know 25 issues of an indie series is huge is uh yeah. pretty hard in today's market All right, i mean i think you're fairly i would call that uh, a pretty major success in indie comics if you could get past 20 mm -hmm. um to be quite honest right if you look at image comics and I'm trying to think of some of the one. I mean, a lot of them kind of die off around 30, 40 issues, right? Because it's really hard. And that's image. So you have right. their marketing, you have their distribution network, you have all these different things. Um, and the only thing that really kills them is the comic book store stop ordering them, right? But I mean, you get to like 30, that's that's huge in comics. Um, I, you know, I I do a lot of conventions. I've been doing this for a while. So I, I talk to other publishers and uh, some established publishers and uh, they've been talking that uh, the last couple of years, standard attrition, what mm. we once knew it, has completely changed. Um, where at one point between issue one and two, you might get a 40% drop off and then a 20 to 10% off each sub subsequent issue. Now they're saying between issue one and two, you get about a 70% drop. And then between issue two and three, another 40. And then it can keep just keep going and um i know a publisher an established publisher he said this beautiful project that these creators wanted to do but they were insisting on 12 issues yeah. and the publisher said there's no way i'll be losing money on every issue after issue six yeah wow just to print the book and I, I you know i don't know what the solution is but i mean i think a big pro problem is is the readers yeah and the readers are gravitating towards trades yeah. and the traditional bookstores or Amazon or books a million or whatever it may be. And it's more collectors in the direct market now. So um, those number ones, those variant covers, mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's what's selling and they're not reading the book. So they don't need to pick up issue four. <laughs> and that's, that kind of hurts, right? It's it's pretty sad because I agree with you. I was going to say, I think one of the big issues is people don't read comics. They're comic fans. They buy comics, but they, they buy what they think they're going to get rich off down the road, right? And we saw this in the 90s in a, right. in a crazy way, right? But it, right. it really hurt the industry for two, three, four years. Oh, yeah. um, it, maybe longer than that. I think it was pretty much most of the 90s was pretty hurt by that. So I, I worked in a comic shop in uh, 92 um, is when I first got my uh, job at a comic shop, a mm -hmm. local shop in Troy, Michigan, and uh, worked at a couple shops, um, moved to Portland when I was 21 and worked at, at uh, Things from Another World out there. And then I came back in uh, 97 uh, to Michigan and purchased an existing shop. Okay. And I had my shop between 97 and 2002. And generally that was the, like the toughest time for comics. Yeah. Um, after the image boom, Valiant, all the speculation, death yeah. of Superman, all of that was behind us. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a very rough time. Very um, but the, but what I've been saying is, you know, I didn't have doom and gloom about the direct market at that time. Yeah. And specifically because of what was going on in the indie comic scene. But yeah. even at Marvel, Marvel Knights was came out at that time when they gave uh, uh, some of the they gave Daredevil and Black Panther to Joe Quesada. Yeah. Um, and that was all about story. 
Mm -hmm. And that was also the start near the start of when trade paperbacks were becoming bigger too. Um, and people starting to, to write for the trades. Um, but you know, that's what solved or that's what saved that time in the industry. Now there was also some speculation, um, the ultimate universe came out in 2001 yeah. um and that was after the uh, big fall in the market so um a lot of people speculated on those books but still that there were increases in the market and that was all through readership yeah. um i think the problem is uh so kickstarter is is, is apparently bucking the trend of the direct market yeah yeah and they say that every subsequent issue that you kickstart um from their data you have better results than the campaign before mm -hmm. now that could also be inflation <laughs> well, that's that's true that could be but I, I mean it makes i think it makes sense because like my first time i did i did an indiegogo and it just failed miserably like i think i had okay. two of my sisters and my parents <laughs> support me and that was it right so it failed miserably so then i you know you, you start to do a little bit of soul searching you already spent a lot of money on issue one and of course my wife is back here going this is a hobby but it's really expensive right so uh and, and she's right it's very expensive hobby um but then i did a kickstarter and then i did really well i didn't say really well i made my goal which was really well for me i was like super i just want to make my yeah. goal i could finish um, issue one, get that out to the folks and then at least make enough to do like eight pages of issue two so that I'm starting the next issue. And then this Kickstarter will finish two and then start three. And that's kind of how I've been trying to do it. That way it forces me to have to go on to the next issue. Okay. Um, so that, that one did well, this one, it's hard to tell because last time that last week I got so much support come in. So I'm hoping okay. that thing now but I've talked to others and they said that their second one was much better than their first. And I'm thinking, you know, usually your goal is a little bit less than your first. You just want to get people to try it and then maybe word of mouth. I don't know. And then all of a sudden the second one, like in the difference between the direct market and a Kickstarter is you might get a hundred backers, 150. So that's 150 issues. You could easily get a 200 issues the next time. And, you know, that's a huge increase over your first time. So I wonder if Kickstarter is considering that as well. Um, there's something to think about with the direct market too, is the numbers. Uh, I've, I've talked with Diamond a few times over the years and uh, they, they, the last time, I don't know how different it may be with the new distribution, other options, yeah. but they told me that um, an average indie comic sells between one and 2000 copies in the direct market wow i don't know there's very few <laughs> kickstarters that get a thousand to two thousand backers exactly and not so technically you know when you're talking an average that's not necessarily a number one so technically there is more readers there yeah um, it's just not the volume um there was the other um, data tidbit that I, I gleaned from them, too, was that an average indie trade, though, sells between 100 and 300 copies. OK, so the idea of people just doing trades and not doing single issues is you're leaving a lot of readers yeah. on the table yeah. that yeah. somebody could, you know, a thousand to two thousand people could read your fourth issue, mm -hmm. but only. 200 people are going to read your trade yeah yeah interesting um, yeah and then but then and i i feel like i'm a little all over but uh th then you have the book market too and that that has been the the um the growth in the industry mm -hmm. and that's why you've seen the distribution wars because yeah growth in the industry is at barnes and noble and amazon and yeah. um yeah <laughs> No, that Luckily, makes there is growth and they're readers and that's the biggest thing is that people aren't collecting trade paperbacks yeah. for an investment mm -hmm. or buying trade paperbacks simply to read yeah no exactly i mean i, I have a lot of trade paperbacks but yeah I, i'm not they're not in sleeves in a box like some right. Other stuff right so yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah wow it's incredible incredible i mean we're in a unique time i think and you know Kickstarter really has become like an additional local comic book store for me. And so yeah. I find myself just kind of going through there 
you know, obviously the art draws you and then you read what the story is about. And it's incredible um, how often I'm on Kickstarter. Obviously I have a Kickstarter so you're on there quite a bit. Yeah. But outside of that, I go there and I'm looking for indie comics and I'm looking to back something that is really cool looking, which is such a new experience for me because all my comics come from one store, one guy, and his name's Ambrose, and he owns <laughs> Diggers Comics and Collectibles here in Hemet. So most oh, of okay. them close to him, right? But I do spend a lot of time on Indiegogo and uh, fund my comic and uh, Kickstarter just looking for something that's unique. And so have you talked to your comic store owner about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's a pretty positive guy. Um, you know, we're in a fairly small town, right? I think there's yeah. about 70,000 people in Hemet. We have San Jacinto. You could add another 50,000 probably. Um, and he's the only comic book store for probably 35 miles or so. We have a graham cracker out in Marietta, but uh, yeah, um, but yeah, he's he's pretty much it, and it's a very small store. Um, but he has everything you need, and uh -huh. uh, he does pretty well. He has a good mixture between like Funko Pops and toys. So I, I'd be really interesting to ask him what percent of his revenue comes from toys and Funko Pops, uh -huh. um, and what comes from comics. It'd be really interesting. And he also has a lot of trades. And okay. so I would love to know the breakdown. If he would share that, it'd be really interesting, but just kind of any, you, you got to be careful because when you go on YouTube, you know, you have this one group that says comics is dead. It's over. And you have this other group that's very positive and everything is great. I, I do think comics are hurting in, in one way because they don't share the data anymore. And yeah. so they'll tell you when a comic does really well, we sold 400,000 copies of this issue, but what you won't get is the top 200 like you used to get and right, how yeah. was sold and that was a recent thing and so i just being in business i always want to share data when i'm winning and i never yeah. want to share data when i'm losing right, right i don't go right, right. out of yeah. our owners and say hey we lost distribution sales are down 10 percent, right and this is the reason why but i do want to go before them and i'll have five thousand slides cut every single way to show the same story, but be able to tell it over and over again about how amazing things are. Right. 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 There, there is something going on that I think has hurt the comic industry, um, mainly floppies. And uh, I do think Kickstarter is a big part of that. Um, a lot of, if you look at like a, a Scott Snyder, you look at some of these amazing writers that I loved on Batman. And now he went to Substack. Substack is yeah. now kind of dropped a little bit, but now they're just doing creator owned. Um, in fact, he writes, uh, what's it called for image? Uh, Greiger. Great. Can't remember how to pronounce it. Guy Geiger. Geiger? Yeah. And so, you know, it, um, you, you start to see these guys go and create these independent comics. Why aren't they going back to DC and Marvel? Um, I know. Them. Well, they probably, those guys probably made more money and, you know, the rumor was with the Substack deal, they got so much money up. They got front. so much money. And I think uh, Substack is about to go rank up from that. I, th I think that did not work out for them as much. Yeah. As they did, right. Um, but Jonathan Hickman, he's he's doing Marvel stuff. But, is you know, he? yeah. I've heard the complaints about the uh, the numbers. And and like you said, as as a business owner and I'm a former shop owner. Yeah. That that diamond chart was informative when i started yeah like that's how i figured out my orders like right. you know when they did it off the batman numbers and stuff and like so you see okay these are selling yeah. like oh well, i should be ordering them too like yeah. oh these aren't well but then there's also the negative side of it these aren't selling so why am i ordering them? exactly yeah so yeah, that, so those are the things that kind of give me a little caution. I was like, it might not be as strong as everyone says it is, but I also don't think it's as bad as everybody says it is either. Like, I go on Wednesday and my little comic book shop is packed. Um, I think it's just our... evolving. I think um, I, I think we probably won't have as many shops. Mm -hmm. It'll be questionable what happens with Diamond now that Image is exclusive with Penguin. Um, uh, but because they're exclusive with penguin random house comics aren't going anywhere exactly like you know web comics or uh, uh webtoons um you know that's a huge platform and there's tons of success stories on that platform that the direct market would not have any idea what they are 
Um, you know, it's the same thing with Dave Pilkey. Dave Pilkey se sells so much dog man and cat kid. It's incredible. It's, it's insane. And, you know, your your average Marvel fan would have no idea who he is or what he does, you know. So there's growth and there's but, you know, again, for people of our age or just generally those who gravitate towards action comics and uh action heroes um that slice that genre isn't dominating in those in those other uh um channels like it does in the direct market True. so and that's good and bad i mean i i don't like my book to be considered a superhero book yeah. But I think the term superhero has become so generic at this time that I've kind of given up trying to fight it. Like Kleenex, um, right? I mean, every tissue you buy is Kleenex and it's not. Well, it's Marvel and DC finally abandoned their trademark on superhero. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. Um, but it became so generic that I've seen news stories where they talk about at Comic-Con people dressing up as superheroes like Luke Skywalker and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. And you're like, well, those aren't superheroes. But yeah. then again, to the general public, they are. It's the same thing. They're doing super stuff. They're heroes. Like, what's the difference? Exactly. Yeah. I, I also, you know, the one thing we didn't mention is anime, too. Yeah. Anime has expanded in the United States. Yeah. Manga. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's still as big as ever. Um, and yeah, uh, and still has growth from my understanding. Um, I think it was last year that the biggest growth when it came to comics and graphic novels were actually in adult graphic novels. Oh, really? Um, where previous years it's been manga or manga uh, and um, kids books. Yeah. But it seems like those are kind of filled now and we're back to adult. That's good. Like drama. Yeah. That's good for me. I, I enjoy that. I'm glad that that's working. Because when oh. I go to Barnes and Noble, you have one row of like your traditional image, DC, IDW. And then you uh, have like seven rows of manga, right? And you're just like, okay, you we don't have the data, but you know, Barnes and Nobles is in the business of generating revenue. Yeah, and, right, right. So you don't give that much shelf space to something that doesn't sell. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's that so how do you break through and also when Marvel and DC kind of have that covered and they're gonna be the biggest sellers in in the uh book markets, you know, like with something like with me with the resistance, how do you really break through that and I haven't really figured it out yet, but you gotta, you gotta market KJ. You gotta figure out the marketing side of it, man. Social media and it's and exclusives hard. with Walmart or yeah, Target. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I've seen some independents get into Walmart. It's been a while, but yeah. I know it's, it's possible. It's very difficult, but it's possible. But I if believe you do, it, man, you're in 4,500 stores overnight like that. Right. I believe it was Alliance, I think was the last one. An A. Yeah. They did uh, Bass Reams with um, Dave Williams and yeah. Kevin Gravo. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, I, what is Chuck Dixon? He has one starts with the A two. I can't remember what it's called, but he has a, his own comic book company that publishes some of his comics. And I saw a sidekick on an end cap of his stuff too. Really? Yeah. At Walmart. At Walmart yeah. Wow. So, the name of his company, but anyways, I was surprised. I'm like. Like, I don't know if it was in every store, but it was in the one here in Hemet. Oh, wow. But once in a while, I'll see floppies on a sidekick, but it's like once or twice a year. It's probably near right. like the holidays. I bet you, you know, October, November, you'll start to see one, one row of like three different comics and that's it. And then they, you do get graphic novels once in a while, though, in their book section. Which is yeah. Cool. And they, they always have a lot of manga or manga, too. <laughs> I I'm whenever I'm in Walmart, like yeah. when I'm looking for toys, yep. um, I always have to look at the comic section just to kind of, you know, the, the books and stuff just to kind of see what's there and what's being pushed out. I mean, Great. yeah, you know, I've seen uh, more recently they had some like, um, what are they? They're called drops or something, you know, like the cardboard shelving thing. And it was a bunch of like, Netflix adaptions like Stranger Things, 
and I maybe a Wednesday comic or something. Pretty cool. You know? And uh, but it was from a bunch of different publishers, too, which was kind of interesting. I wonder so, if Mark Millar was on there, too, right? Because he's one of the directors of uh, Netflix and the Miller world is now. Right. No, I don't I don't think it was any of his stuff. Yeah. Um because that's actually Netflix comics. It seemed more like somebody, uh, maybe Lock and Key. Okay. Um, but it seemed more like a distributor who handled a bunch of different publishers put together like, oh, you know, here's all these adaptions or things that tie into the things that are on TV right now. Yeah. And I mean, I that's think, pretty cool, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you see that stuff every once in a while and hopefully it hits and hopefully it, it keeps people reading. And mm -hmm. I think that's what the most important thing about comics, too, as we talk about this, mm -hmm. like it's so much fun to collect. I mean, you know, I I always joke I'm a collector, hoarder and seller in that order. <laughs> um, and. You know, I, I think, you know, a lot of us just love to collect, even if it's not about pristine or, you know, even when it comes to trades, you end up with a huge bookshelf full of trades <laughs> before you know it. Exactly. Uh, so I'm not disparaging the collectors, yeah, um, yeah. but I just think that that the growth with the industry, it's got to come with readers. It, does. And, it has to come with readers. Yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. And story. <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's my attraction is the story, right? You, you'll get me to buy one comic probably if the art is just crazy good. But if I don't like what I'm reading, I'll never buy the issue too, right? Right, right. So, right. You, you trick me once, man, but you're not going to give me that second time. It's a nice you're... art book. And yeah. That's why you can just get the first one. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, KJ, let's, before we take off, I want to make okay. sure that we do talk about your Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I think that's really important um, that people get out there how close are you to your goal? Do you know the percent to goal or have you hit it yet? You know, we're, I think we're at 52%. Okay. Our goal is 3000. Um, so we're just over 1500. Um, yeah, this campaign has been pretty slow. Um, I haven't been crazy about it, uh, but it's, you know, it's kind of trucking along at the right, hitting the right spots where, I think on the last day we'll get funded. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <what> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, you know, it's a new uh, resistance uh, issue. Number one, uh, uh, the new um, story arc is called the bounty hunter blitz. So um, anybody can go to the uh, uh, go to bounty hunter blitz.com and you can go, it'll take you right to the campaign. Nice. Um, but after the uh, events in the first mini series, uh, the resistance have uh, huge bounties on their head. And uh, after six months, they poked their heads out and uh, ended up having to battle an uh, army of bounty hunters. <laughs> I love it. I and love then there's it. there's a lot of character stuff in there, too. But sure. that's that's the fun stuff. Just all these fun characters that were thrown at them and stuff. Well, if you like action, this is definitely the comic book to read because the action scenes are absolutely incredible. And there's a lot of them, right? There's a lot of back and forth, which I love. Yeah, right I think I, sometimes I think it's too much. Uh, but uh, Jason Johnson, the artist on the series, he loves it. You know, I end up kind of doing like eight pages of a fight scene and then crunch two pages of uh, <laughs> a, a quiet scene, you know, <laughs> and try and come right back into the action. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's, it's just, there's something about... I, I I get bored with things very easy. So yeah. if you don't hit me coming out of the gate, yeah. I usually kind of lose interest. Yeah. And so that's how I've been trying to create comics is trying trying to hit the reader right out of the gate and have some fun. And we can get into, you know, the nook and crannies of the story later in the issue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love it. I love it. You just come right out of the gate, man. Come out swinging and I love it. So yeah, so you're at 52%. You got uh, how many days left, you know? Um, uh, I think 17. Uh, we end on October 13th. And it was a 30-day, right, you did? Yeah, yeah. And Probably 50% so, through almost 50% time, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, we're in that lull where it's really slow. Um, one of the coolest things we have in this campaign is we have a, uh, a Joe action figure homage. Nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, an artist, Brad Thingvold, uh, digitally painted. 
So oh. it looks as if it's a carded GI Joe uh, vintage oh. O-ring finger figure, but it's actually interval and it says the resistance and <laughs> he did just a spot on job. And really, if you're a GI Joe fan, and you think it's cool, you should hire him. He's affordable. I'll give you his number. Like, Please. yeah, I love that. <laughs> doing it for everybody. Yes, yes, I love that. That's awesome. Well, I mean, I, I could just encourage everybody to please um, go to the Kickstarter, support this Kickstarter. You're going to love it. Um, and then to get some of the, the back issues, they could just go right to your website and pick these up, right? Yeah, you can order uh, direct through our website, which is bigbluecomics.com. Yep. Um, we also have, uh, bundles in the Kickstarter where you can get all the previous issues. Um, we have a couple different levels there, but, uh, and a lot of the, uh, standard covers are mm -hmm. available as add-ons from the campaign too. Awesome. And, awesome. uh, we actually did just a couple of these as add-ons. I know I'm gonna have to go there right now to make sure I get one. Homage to the original GI Joe comic. Love it, man. That's so dope. <laughs> and that was another one where you could lay it on top and all of the lines. I don't know if you remember from the GI Joe where it's all the blasts. Yeah. Or all of the lines that bring you into the center of that image. Like I even you, like the S where you kind of did it in the, in the flag. You didn't go too right. Crazy. Right. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Just to let you know. <laughs> I see yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, area. I, I know it, it seems like it's be, getting like beaten to death. The, the homage covers. But they're cool. Um, they are really yeah, cool. yeah. We yeah. we have a couple. I have a couple X Men ones that Jason Johnson did that I, I are just in the drawer right now. X Men <laughs> number one and Giant Size X Men number one. Nice. Um, we've been kind of saving those for if when we're uh, eventually do Diamond releases. Oh okay. Wow, that would be right. really cool. That would be really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> to see these characters jumping out off the page like that, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah yeah um i'll send you something <laughs> yeah nice yeah well kj i can't tell you how much i appreciate you jumping on yeah, oh you're pretty great busy. sorry if i you know this ended up just being a conversation <laughs> i love it i mean i think if you listen to this you're gonna learn a lot i think um okay and, uh, yeah I I just, I'm not too non-linear <laughs> no i love it i love it kj and i would love to have you back on again um yeah anytime and uh um I don't know if you uh, if I can talk one of the artists um, to coming on. That'd be awesome. Um, instead, like Jason Johnson, or maybe get you in contact with uh, Ben or Drew or something. I love it. Yeah, we would love to have him on. Love to talk comics. I could do this all day long. <laughs> right. Uh, I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> all all right. right, Jay. Thank you so, so much. Okay. Wish you the very best, my friend. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. Uh, I love what you're doing. I was able to check out a bunch of the episodes before I came on, and it's nice. really cool, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, this one will be up pretty soon, man, and I can't wait to see how people okay. react. But it'll be fun. Awesome. Uh, do you want me uh, to send you anything like uh, 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 cover images or anything like that? Do you that would be great. Yeah, things? if you could send whatever over, um, then I could okay. add that as we're talking. Um, oh, okay. that would be awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and okay. then at the front too, I think.